Oh, yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the Harwood. My name is Nicole Dial Kay. I'm the curator of exhibitions and collections here at the Harwood. And we appreciate all of you being here on this very busy weekend in Taos. Uh, we are so delighted to welcome four of the exhibiting artists from Outriders Legacy of the Black Cowboy to our Taos community. They've traveled from New York, Portland, Philadelphia, and Chicago to be with us this weekend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we are also honored that Taos' own Nikesha Breeze can be with us to moderate this distinguished panel. Nikesha served as one of the exhibition advisors for this exhibition. The advisory committee also included Larry Callies, the founder of the Black Cowboy Museum, Rita Powdell, the director of the African American Museum and Cultural Center of New Mexico, Daphne Rice Allen, the board chair of the Black American West Museum and Heritage Center, and Ari Myers, the owner and curator of the Valley and Taos. This committee was fundamental to the responsible creation of this important exhibition that unearths parts of our Southwest history often untold. They provided feedback on the checklist, writing, and layout of the space. We're grateful to each of them for their invaluable work. Before I hand things over to Nikesha, who will introduce the panel of artists, I want to say a few words of thanks to the sponsors of the exhibition and this event. The exhibition is made possible in part by Monmar Charitable Trust, Rosa Maria Ellis Clark Estate, the Harvard Museum Alliance, Roberts Projects, Very Small Fires, Kasman Gallery, Rose Gallery, Monique Miloche Gallery, Spaghetti Western, and support, support for this program is provided in part by the New Mexico Humanities Council and by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs and National Endowment for the Arts. Artist accommodations are generously supported by the historic Taos Inn. Also, we have to say a big thanks to our incredible preparators who hung the show and our brilliant curator of education and public programs who's disappeared. Gwendolyn Fernandez, who put this entire event together. Can we give them a quick round of applause? As a reminder, following this panel, there will be a reception in the backyard. We hope you can join us there to continue the conversation with our artists. This program is also being filmed and will be shared on our YouTube account in the coming days. And now, it's my honor to introduce Nikesha Breeze, our moderator for today's panel. Nikesha's interdisciplinary work reimagines the possibility of healing intergenerational traumatic inheritance through the intersection of art, ritual, and remembrance. She uses performance art, film, painting, textile, sculpture, and site-specific engagement to build a counter-narrative of a realm of indivisibility between Black artistic aesthetic, Black time, and ritual healing. Originally from Portland, Oregon, Nikesha lives and works in the high deserts of New Mexico. She's an American-born African diaspora descendant of the Mende people of Sierra Leone and a Syrian-American immigrant from Iran. Please join me in welcoming Nakisha to the stage. Thank you, Nicole. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to have this conversation and really excited to have these amazing artists with me today. Um, I want to get right into it, so I'm going to call everybody up. If you all want to come take a seat, I will introduce us. This, um, the whole gathering of this show, the, this talk, all of it is feels historic in this space. So I just want to thank again the Harvard Museum for creating the, the opening for these conversations. Um, let me begin with Nate Young. Uh, Nate Young uh, is a multidisciplinary artist currently working in Chicago, Illinois. Um, in 2009, Young received the Master's of Fine Arts from the California Institute of Arts, Valencia. That same year, he completed a residency at the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the Skohegan. Um, he received his BA in Visual Arts Education from Northwestern College. In 2004, working across media, oh, in 2004, working across media in a manner that challenges traditional modes of artistic production, Young creates works that engage with issues of race and racialization. He explores the systems and objects that impact one's beliefs. Often in his work, Young addresses theological themes through text, diagrams, or architectural elements. His work is in notable collections, including the Walker Art Center, Minneapolis, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., 
the Mont Marsh Collection in Flint, Michigan, and the Fabric Workshop Museum in Philadelphia. Let's welcome Nate. Next, I have Ron Tarver. Um, Ron uh, received a BA in Journalism and Graphic Arts from Northeastern State University in Oklahoma and an MFA from the University of Arts in Philadelphia before becoming an Associate Professor at Swarthmore. Tarver was a photojournalist at the Philadelphia Inquirer for 32 years, where he shared a 2012 Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize for his work on a series documenting school violence in the Philadelphia public school system and has been nominated three previous times. His work has appeared in National Geographic, Life, Time, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, and Black White Magazine. A recipient of the prestigious Pew Fellowship in the Arts, he's also received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts through Black Inc. in Oklahoma City, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and two Independence Foundation Fellowships. He was named one of the Delaware Valley's 50 Rising Stars in the Arts by Seven Arts Magazine, and is an alumnus of the Center for Emerging Visual Arts. Welcome, Ron. <laughs> Ivan McClellan. Ivan is a photojournalist and designer based in Portland, Oregon. His essays have been featured in ESPN, The Undefeated, Fast Company, and Juxtapose. Ivan has led creative projects for Nike, Adidas, US National Soccer, Oregon Ducks, and Disney. His work has been displayed in galleries across the country, including Oklahoma Contemporary, BJ Spilk Gallery, and the New York Center for Photographic Art. Ivan is a husband and father of two children. And finally, we have Praise Fuller. Praise is a visual artist specializing in cyanotypes, an alternative photographic printing process. She explores the mutability of this medium while constantly expanding the practice through experimentation of print, installation, objects, video, and materials. Welcome, Praise. <laughs> so now that we've um, gotten all of the, the names listed, um, I'm so happy to have you here. Brilliant, brilliant artists and brilliant contributors to this, um, this field of the Black Cowboy. Um, and documenting and leaning into it. Um, your work, and I'm hoping all of you had a, had a chance to walk through the museum and see the work and um, come into it. I wanna try and help connect that work with the individuals you have in front of you. So we're going to go through and, and show the works that they have here in the show. And I'd love to hear from each of you a little bit about these particular pieces and their context and their creation Whatever you'd like to share about this work in context with the show. So if we can put that on the slides. We'll begin with Alan. <coughs> I'll hand you the mic. Hi, I'm Ivan McClellan. Um, yeah, I've been photographing this subject matter for uh, eight years now. This is my eighth year. Uh, I was very inspired by Ron, um, who went to this exact rodeo. This is the Roy LeBlanc Invitational Rodeo. Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and um, he photographed it years years before me, but was really moved by your work, and um, it's definitely influenced my work. This is an event called Pony Express. Um, two teams of eight run around an arena and pass a baton in between horses, and the first team to drop uh, to run through all eight riders drop a baton in a barrel in the middle of the arena wins the event. Um, it's you, you really only see it in Oklahoma, um, and it's incredibly exciting. The crowd goes nuts, and the teams are like, you know, real like sports teams. People show up wearing their t-shirts, and um, in, in this particular shop, Ron and I were talking about closeness in, in our work, and uh, here I'm, I'm entirely too close to the horses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually in the arena on the dirt, uh, a, a big chunk of dirt flew into my camera soon after I took this shot. So that's just been the been the nature of uh, this project is getting not only closer to to the action when I shoot that, but getting closer to the people, you know, building relationships, and it's kind of gone for far beyond uh, just being a documentary project. It's um, 
it, it's it's as you can see by my dress, a lifestyle. Right? It's, it's something that I'm starting to do more authentically, um, but still creating work in this space. Um, this is a uh, Court to Solomon. Um, she's a fourth generation cowgirl. Her entire family are barrel racers uh, outside Houston, and. Um, she, I was telling them earlier, she really art directed this photo. She was 11 and she was like, I want to pedal in front of this bush with my hat down with a serious face. <laughs> so I really, I really didn't do too much here. Um, well, we're not smoking. Hopefully we know Oh yeah, this is uh, Tiffany and Liam Carter. And uh, this is in a little town called Bristow, Oklahoma. Uh, oftentimes when I'm in Oklahoma, uh, it's just about to storm. And um, this was uh, an electric orange sky that I had the privilege of, of shooting in that you really can only find, find in Oklahoma. Um, you know, she was just there with the kid on the horse watching, watching the events. Uh, Tiffany Carter is a, is a barrel racer. So she was just posting up. Uh, a lot of times I used to ask folks how they got into riding horses or competing in their events, and they never really had a good answer um, because this is how they learn. It's just like riding with your mom or dad. Um, it's just something that's, that's bred into them. Um, but yeah, that's my work. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Farwood and Lakeisha and everybody for putting this on. Um, so I have the unique uh, privilege of being the oldest person here. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been working on this project for like over 30 years. And uh, I was talking to Ivan, it's like, I, you know, I look at these images and I think, so I'm looking at the 30 or the 30 something year old images and having a conversation with that person, you know. And, how would I photograph it now? And I, you know, we, we went over all the different ways that I would not shoot that I did now or then. But, um, but you know, I mean, I, I shot this project for the Inquirer first, and then went on to National Geographic and shot it for them. And uh, I think I was so influenced by the National Geographic, Geographic style, and I was getting you know tips from all of the legends and, and you know Bill Allard and. Sam Abel, all the people that I grew up with, flipping through the magazine, all of a sudden I was shooting for them, going in their office and saying, what should I do? And I was just going, I, I went into Bill Allard's uh, work. My editor was saying, you, just, you can't shoot in the middle of the day. You gotta shoot the golden hour, you know? And I was like, so I was doing that. And then I took my work in to, to Bill Allard and he said, well, you gotta sh find the good light and the bad light. And I was like, <laughs> so I spent like a month trying to figure that out, out in the field, shooting and shooting and shooting. But, um, but you know, so I wound up with about over 2,000, and this was back in the day, it wasn't digital, it was slides, it was all uh, color film. So I wound up with over 2,000 slides, and during COVID I went through everything and, you know, sorted it out. But I'm finally, I'm going to just do a book on it, which has been a long slog. <laughs> But hopefully the book will come out next year, and I want to do an exhibition. Um, but, um, but yeah, so it's you know, so the, the, the images here are more portrait-like. Um, I have everything, you know. I went all over the country and photographed the rodeos and spent time in the back of pickup trucks with cowboys going to these little tiny rodeos in the middle of nowhere to earn twenty bucks, you know. And it was truly a a, an experience you, you just wouldn't have. But yeah, so yeah, so most of these are portraits. These are just some of the people that were at the rodeos. Um, and I, you know, I was really intrigued by the father and son combination. There's so many of them, and, and uh, um, so I focused a lot on them. Oh, the one that was just shown. Let me back up that one. Yeah, so this one, this was a young man named David Cormier. And David was, so one of the things I wanted to do in this project was I wanted to find some of the quintessential sort of true cowboy, you know, like somebody that didn't just, you know, you know, do this is for fun. Or, well, I wanted to find somebody that really lived the life of a cowboy. And, 
and uh, I found uh, David Cormier down in Brownsville, Texas, and he was living on a, on a, on a farm, uh, really like a big mud pit, basically, in a trailer given, by, given him by his uncle. And uh, I, I spent a week with him shooting, and uh, while I was there, he had a limp, he walked with a limp, and I went to the doctor, they did an MRI and found that he had cancer disease. And um, so I, I think, you know, I'd spent that time with him. I said, well, I have to go and I'll, I'll come back. And the week after I got back, his mom called and said, well, they, they canceled the pesticides and spread. And long story short, he passed away at 20. <laughs> and so I called this Dave's last ride because he, he was just, Lord God, this room though, it's so fitting of his spirit. He was just such, he was such an amazing young man. Um, and I, you know, I did a whole, Project just on Dave, which could be a book in and of itself. Um, and then the next one is this, you know, this father and son here. And then what's the next one? Uh, oh, this was at the rodeo that I've been shot. This was during the grand injury when all the cowboys and cowboys <coughs> come into the rodeo for the grand injury. And uh, and then you know, it was just one of those. It was just a beautiful light coming in. And uh, she just happened to look off at the distance and uh, just happened to get it. And then what was the other one? Uh, oh, the connection. So I didn't do this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Praise. I'm eternally grateful to be here. Um, one of my first shows, I'm going to get to sit with some of my favorite artists. Um, so this will never not feel surreal. <laughs> um, but these are my three pieces. Um, they are huge cyanotypes. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas. Um, I didn't grow up riding or anything, but I've always had a love for horses. And I went to the rodeo every year. I had a little pair of red cowgirl boots. Huh. and. I would spend all the time like in the petting zoo, um, and I didn't even care about the musical artists that were performing. I only wanted to see the events going on. Um, and I remember the first book I ever checked out at a library was a horse encyclopedia. <laughs> um, but then once I got old enough, I started taking lessons, um, and I just felt that there was such a spiritual connection between someone and their horse, even if it's for a short time, um, if I would just be with those horses for like an hour or two, um, a couple times a week. Um, and then also just like dealing with um, stubborn horses and that journey and what that teaches you about yourself and the animal. Um, I think it's a very mutual and beautiful relationship. Um, and so, Back in 2021, I spent some time in West Texas on a vineyard, and I drove down um, at five in the morning um, in the mountains to go to Latifas, Texas, to be able to go on a full day's ride. So I was on a horse for about six to eight hours in the hot sun, um, and I only had like a water bottle this size, and the guy was like, are you stupid? <laughs> I'm a liability. I don't, I'm not going to let you go out there. And me and the girl that I was with just like begged him. We were like, if you pass out, like that's on us. It's fine. I'm not going to sue. Um, and we went out there. It was absolutely incredible. And these pictures were actually just taken on my phone with the girl that I was with. Um, and something I really love about getting a chance to do these is they're the biggest cyanotypes that I've ever made and also have ever seen actually. Huh. Um, and it was such a trial and error process because um, I also only had one chance with each of these. So I just kind of had to plan out what errors would happen and how to foresee how I would um, make sure that visually things would still come out. Um, bought a lot of weird equipment. Um, I actually had to print it in sections. Um, so I bought like blackout curtains to cover certain sections while I printed one section. 
um, and it came out super seamlessly. Um, and I'm just really in love with it. I feel like, um, you know, over the past couple of years, I know people are getting more familiar with black cowboys and cowgirls. And I remember when uh, Solange's album, When I Get Home, um, came out, um, <coughs> it was just in awe of the visuals of the album. Um, and I watched it several times and I just wanted to be able to have something that's just so huge and great to have for you know little girls out there that want to ride horses one day and also just for me to be able to remember i don't know history that i'm also a part of um so yeah um okay so this work comes out of a larger body of work. It's kind of a long story, but I'm gonna try to summarize so that I don't talk too long. Um, a lot of my work, I would say, to start, a lot of my work, it moves around. It's a lot, it takes a lot of different kinds of forms. I identify as a conceptual artist, but I always come back to drawing as a way of like, you know, it, it, the immediacy of drawing is important for me because sometimes when I'm working in a way where I have to figure out how to do something, that process takes quite a bit of time. Right now, I'm from the figuring out how to ride a horse, but okay. <laughs> the short version of a longer story is that uh, I think it was the last time that I spoke with my grandmother, she told me this story. My older brother had found these photographs in her basement, uh, and one of the photographs that he found was a photograph of her father, my great-grandfather. And she was talking, she, so she started telling us the story about how he had left the South in the, probably around, I think we kind of located it around 1919, which technically would have been before the Great Migration would have started in 1920, but he had left the South uh, under duress uh, that he was in some kind of trouble. Uh, and, and she said they were trying to get him. Um, years and years later, I came back to thinking about that story um, and was in, in an attempt to find more information about him. Long story short, I found the location of the horse that he had ridden, with the, the burial location of the horse that he had ridden from the south to the north, somewhere in the south. We, I didn't know at the time, but he landed in, in Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia in this town called Ardmore. So there was a bunch of work that I was doing that had to do with the bones of that horse, which I unearthed from the ground. Uh, and then I got a grant from this foundation called the Shifting Foundation. And I had this idea that I would recreate his journey from the South. And I figured, I did some research and figured out that through, you know, looking at some of the archives and the, um, uh, you know, the historical records uh, that he had come from North Carolina. So I, I bought a horse. I've been training to do this journey. In the meantime, I had always been trying to think about how to make a photograph of him, or not a photograph, make a drawing of him. I was trying to find that photograph that my brother had found. I, I never was able to find that photograph. Uh, but this self-portrait, I also think about as a portrait of my great-grandfather, because in the photograph that my brother found, he was standing next to a horse. Uh, so this was a, this this drawing was kind of a way of me conceptualizing him, like creating an image for myself of him and his horse, even though at the same time it's an image of me and my horse. And um, you know, and to a certain extent, there's a way in which for me the 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 obfuscation of the image of myself and the obfuscation of the horse through layering but also through sort of like blacking out or um, you know, removing the body, the image of the body, was a way that, that this image could simultaneously be two different people, two different horses, two different moments in time. Uh, the title of these are Untimed, In Black Untimed. I had something to do with Untimed. But I, I guess when I also when I was making these drawings, I'm gonna stop talking after this. When I was making these drawings, 
I was reading this text by this theorist, uh, he's out at UC Irvine, his name's John Morillo III, and it's a, he is in the text expanding on um, his theory of, it's called Afro-pessimism. To, to summarize, the idea, what the definition of Afro-pessimism essentially is that anti-blackness not only is um, the exclusion of black blackness or black people from the category of the human, but it is actually that exclusionary process that ontologically produces the idea of the human in the first place. John Murillo, as an Afro-pessimist, is also concerned with the cosmos, and his premise is that not only does anti-blackness ontologically produce the idea of the human, but also produces the way in which we understand time itself, and that blackness essentially calls for a new way of conceptualizing time. So in thinking about that, and thinking about my own identity as a kind of existential question of like who, what it means to be, uh, that idea of simultaneously producing an image of my great-grandfather and myself, I was thinking about as a kind of a distortion of time that, uh, you know, that the image could also, could be two different points in time. I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I really love this. I, I was actually just on a panel last week and, and with other black artists and we went right into this idea of time and the shifting you know, of time. So I'm really glad that you brought that in here too because that's one of the things that I found, you know, the intergenerational, you know, width of this show, of this panel, you know, that, and experience, et cetera, this way of seeing and um, holding the image of the black cowboy through time, right? Like how much that the black cow, the image, and I put this in quotes, of the image of the black cowboy because it is crafted also, right? This is something that came up just watching or listening to you talk about your work with um, the image of Courtney and her direction. I mean, like, okay, it's gonna be this bush, this face, this ex you know, expression, and how much agency that that is, and that's calling for, right? And black people through time have had to claim agency of their image, right? And so this image of the black cowboy I'm curious how you have all taken that in your work and held on to it. Like, what are the what are the characteristics that you are highlighting in your work to tell the story of the black cowboy? Anybody want to start? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. So I think we all sort of approach this idea of the, you know, what the black cowboy in in different ways. But um, you know, when I was talking with, with Ivan, it's, it's for me, it's more about the collective, right? the collective exposure of the black, of the idea of the black cowboy to the broader community because the cowboy has sort of been, the idea of the cowboy has been crafted in all these ways. And how we think about cowboys, we think about it in this one particular structure, this one particular narrative. And so what we're doing is we're blowing that whole thing up and presenting the idea of it in new and inventive ways, you know, and then uh, he's like right up my alley with the, with the, with the way we think about time, and I won't get into it, but <laughs> <laughs> the quantum physics of this has just been on my mind for a long time. But anyway, um, you know, when you get down to the essence of, 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 of things, you know, if you get down to the, the essence of the quanta, you know, we're all we're all one being, but it's how that quantum sort of expands out in, in time and through space and anyway, anyway. But so I approach it through through my work through journalism. And and I think that's that's the argument that I have with my younger self is that I don't think I would necessarily approach it that way now because I just know more now. You know, and I think I would it would definitely influence my photography. And I think I would, I would think inf I would uh, think about it more. Not so much. My my thing was to communicate. I wanted to communicate. I wanted <laughs> just 
take it in the, and just whack you over the head with a hammer because all of my experiences in dealing with black cowboy, being told by editors in New York that there are no such things as black cowboys, and I'm sitting there with 10,000 slides that say, yes, there is, you know, that nobody would, would, nobody would print my book. So, um, and just, I could go on and on and on. But, um, but I think, you know, the way that we're sort of blowing this idea of, Blackness and the Black West and Black Cowboys, and not just Cowboys, but it's 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 the um, the lifestyle, and it's not even so much the lifestyle. I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma. I knew that there were Black Cowboys. My you know, I had my my uh, great uh, my grandfather was a working cowboy, you know, and I didn't even question it. But when I went to Philadelphia and started working on this project, and then I went to New York one time and. The group that I was photographing went to New York and there was a big parade and um, it stopped traffic on Fifth Avenue and there was a white woman in the car and she looked at me and she goes, what are these, black cowboys? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's just that kind of thing that's, it, it, it just, you know, so my, my thing was to communicate this idea. But I think there's, I think what we're doing as a collective and what other people, not just us, but what other people, other artists and other our journalists are doing is they're expanding that idea and they're just pushing it out there. It's just that 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 force, hopefully, will change things in, in the way that the idea of like how how boy is perceived. Um, I feel like at least through my work, um, I think a lot about representation um, and while that's important it shouldn't be the answer like um, I appreciate this show and I hope that people walk through this show and it doesn't leave their minds whenever they exit the building um, and I feel like a lot of times how I approach a piece is I want my piece to be more of a question than an answer to anything. Um, and I feel like I always encourage curiosity and the ability to ask questions and have questions form from the media that we consume. And I know that um, for a while there's been a lot of like black cowboy movies coming out. Um, a lot of, you know, I know like the Conjuring Cowboys, like they have been getting a lot of recognition and fame. Um, and while I think, like I said, representation is important, I think that it should just be a step um, and that there is more to, you know, learning about our history. Um, and I just hope that, I don't know, at least through like seeing my piece, it's just something that stays with you and you're able to, I don't know, go out into the world and spread the message of black cowboys and um, I saw cowboys with no cowboy hat, no shirt, gold chains, braids, acrylic nails, um, the dazzle from head to toe, basketball shorts, basketball shoes. Um, I saw a culture um, cowboy in a really, really authentic way that looked nothing like John Wayne. Um, and so I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disrupt that. My first solo exhibition was at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. And I walked through that museum and I saw, you know, Buffalo Bill's Wild West and this myth that he created, you know, his, his own story is a little bit dubious. Nobody really knows that he rode on the Pony Express. Nobody really knows how many buffalo he killed. Um, he sort of took his own narrative and exploded it and expanded it into this show that traveled the world that eventually influenced uh, the figures that you see in cinema. And on an 
entire floor of that museum was my work. I had 43 images of these black cowboys with no shirt that were um, completely opposite of what was proposed on the upper floors throughout these Buffalo Field Wildlife Show. Um, so that's how it started out, but over time, I've become less interested in the global meaning of my work and really interested in, in what it means for me personally. And, and how it transforms and impacts my life. Um, the relationships that I have with the people that I've photographed have become really, really rich. Um, I've lost friends in, the, in this culture and it, and it hurts, you know, it hurts every day. Um, <coughs> like losing a family member. Um, and I, I shoot rodeos because I enjoy them. I'm producing my own rodeo because I, I want to, because it's fun. Um, and, and so like, as I, as I continue to work in the subject matter, the, my, my purpose in it, my intent gets, it's very, very simple. It's really, really clear. And it just comes down to, I, I like this. <laughs> Obviously, I, I think, um, in, in my work, I've always been, open, well, I usually don't make figurative work. I usually don't make um, you know, representation or maybe even not figurative. Like I usually deal with the body by not looking at the body. And uh, I guess for me, I'm, I think about the strength or maybe it's sometimes in a way, at least like looking directly at something is not always, it doesn't always mean that you, what you're seeing is the truth or what you're seeing is real. I'm interested in what you see at the periphery of sight. Um, that you know, maybe when we see something directly, we process it really quickly, and we don't get into, we don't process it at a, at a deeper level. So there's a, you know, I mean, and you see in the drawings, there's a, there's an obs obscuring of the body, because I'm thinking about how to look at it in a, through the periphery. How do you reference a body without the presence of the body, or maybe the in presence of the body? Is, is the most, for me, the most direct way that I can, you know, conjure a, a, a question or a conversation about the body. All right, um, I'm loving all the little uh, jumping off points you're leaving for me. <laughs> and just this, the conversation, one of the questions that I had thought about when thinking about this work and thinking about talking with you all was the relationship of liberation to the idea of the black cowboy, you know, and this place, and when I talk about liberation, like it, it look, it's layered, right? We, you mentioned the Great Migration, right? And even before then, the Exodusters, you know, in the early, or the late part of the 1800s, you know, these movements of, you know, African-American people and formerly enslaved people moving out west, moving out into the south, you know, and claiming space, and, and also claiming their own uh, agency and power and capacity. And one of the big movements that we know happened was that there was a huge wealth of black cowboys, right? That moving through as ranchers and, you know, carrying, moving through with the herds, you know, learning and working with, directly with indigenous and vaqueros from Mexico out here in the South, you know, the skill building, skill sharing, community building, all of that comes back to you know, what I feel you were both saying too, that relationship with the horse, the body of the horse, the, the people and the communities that arise around, around ranching, around you know, the black cowboy, the, what it takes to live out in, in the fields, right? You know, um, those connectivities. So my question is, what are the, personal lessons that you've learned from the Black Cowboy about that, about liberation, about power, um, through your experience of witnessing firsthand at ranch work, experiencing it firsthand in your own lives, you know, what is it that you see are the most valuable lessons that you've learned you know, from this? Um, you know, just, just thinking about that migration, uh, there's a big rodeo in a town called Bowley in Oklahoma. And it's a, a black town 
that was formed by, by freed enslaved folks. Um, and they had their own bank and their own industry and um, the town gradually sort of deteriorated. People left and went to bigger cities and it looks almost like an architectural ruin today. At, I think it's peak, there were 5,000 residents there and now there are about 800 or less and there, there are buildings crumbling, the water tower is rusted out, but the people that live there are really steeped in thriving in, in cowboy culture. Every Memorial Day, there's a rodeo there and a um, parade, and thousands of people come back to Bowie. It's like a, a, a mass migration of people that have roots there or people that have family there. And, and they, they put on a heck of a rodeo. It's not a big money rodeo. People just come because, because they love it and they want to be around community. Um, I met a cowgirl there named Margie Gibbons. And she, I met her at the rodeo. She was riding a uh, Bronco, which women don't typically do. But she rode a Bronco for about five seconds. The crowd went nuts. The, the announcer made fun of her. I could hear her dad laughing in the crowd at her like it was a, it was a scene. But she, I went and talked to her and, and we became friends and um, she just, you know, it was no surprise that she rode this Bronco. Like she grew up breaking horses uh, on her family ranch and um, she was just not, not entertained enough by doing barrel racing. And she wanted to do, do prettier sports. Um, I said, you know, something about black cowboys. And she said, why do you keep saying that? And I said, because, uh, you know, that's what I shoot. I shoot black cowboys. She said, you know, I uh, grew up in Bowie. I grew up with my uncles. We were riding Broncos and Bulls. And um, I went to a Walmart in Oklahoma City when I was a kid. And I saw a white man in a cowboy hat. And I said to my dad, uh, why is that white man wearing a cowboy hat? <laughs> She was like, I, I, I think there are white cowboys, <laughs> black people are just cowboys. <laughs> so, um, that was sort of the context. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of freedom there, and there's a lot of, you know, personality and, and individuality that comes out of being from a place where she can, you know, be truly and, and authentically herself. And I've run into that so many times, you know, doing this work. So, yeah, so it's, it's interesting, you know, you talk about Bowie that way. I mean, I, I, like I said, I grew up in Oklahoma, I spent my whole life in Oklahoma, uh, up until the point that I moved. But, um, you know, places like, so Oklahoma had the largest collection of black towns in the country. And so places like Bowie, Taft, Redbird, OK, OK Holbrook, all those towns, like you said, are just shells of towns now. They're not. For a lot of different reasons, urban renewal you go down the line. Even Oklahoma City uh, had that happen. Um, so I grew up associating places like Bowley and Taft as negative. You know, like Taft had, I think, it was, I think Taft had a big prison there. And so we always associated you know, Taft and Bowley. One of the guys, Bowley, Bowley had the prison. So we had, um, so I always grew up thinking that looking at Bowley as a negative, you know, and I knew they had the rodeo, and sometimes we'd go to the rodeo, but it was always a negative. So one of the things for me is that I've learned that it's more of appreciation. I've gained more of an appreciation for the idea of black Western life. That I, you know, it's like, you know, a fish swims in water, you don't know, the fish doesn't recognize the water. It was for me the same way. I was swimming in it and didn't recognize it until I left and then started working on this project and got a, a whole new appreciation for the culture. Um, so for me, the, the liberation part of it maybe comes within me. You know, I just feel more liberated in the way that I think about black culture and, and black Western culture, I guess. Um, you know, and I could go on about that too, but, um, but it's so rich and it's so steeped and it goes, and it, it, once you drill down into it, you just, there's layer after layer after layer that, that, that 
perfectly fine, you know, like the young woman you were talking about that didn't recognize, you know, but, you know, which is, it's, that's the flip side of, of how, you know, um, I think the, the country thinks about outdoors, you know, but this young woman growing up in it saw it the other way. So it's, it's just, to me, it's just fascinating. That's a fascinating part of this project. So. <laughs> Um, I liked what you said a lot about like, agency and community. Um, and when I think about liberation, um, an image comes to mind um, when I went to like a, a Black Lives Matter protest, um, and this was in Houston, uh, where I'm from. And there was a group of black cowboys with um, like their fists up. Um, and I believe they are called like the Freedom Riders. Um, but just seeing that, I feel like um, kind of like your work where it's like two moments in time, I could really feel the parallels of just, um, I do a lot of um, organizing work. And so I thought a lot about um, present day organizing and um, organizing that was going on in like the Black Belt um, with between like sharecroppers, farmers, um, and how that parallels with present day. And I just kind of think about um, the liberation that I feel just in organizing spaces um, and in community. And um, I don't know how that is how wonderful that feels. <laughs> Maybe the uh, the ox, uh, the mule, the horse, and the slave are like all just as, as important to like the foundational uh, economic structure and construction of the the, the, the capitalist you know United States that we live in. Uh, there's this there's this uh, speech by Frederick Douglass in 1873, and uh, I think it's in Tennessee where he's talking to an agricultural convention. And he says something along the lines of that, you know, at post-emancipation, uh, that black folks should should continue to think about the ox, the mule, uh, the horse as as co-equals, you know, as opposed to subjugating the animals that we should think about them in terms of like equals. And, and I remember I was thinking that when I first read it, I was thinking about the potential that like somehow Frederick Douglass was like an anachronistically a kind of like climate change activist. <laughs> and I was, and, and I guess so when you ask about the, like the liberatory force of blackness, it, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with these ideas of time and the like non-Newtonian, non-Aristotelian time. Uh, and, so, and, the, and the idea that somehow uh, Frederick Douglass could be a climate change activist, I think, that the, the liberatory force of blackness is it has the potential to completely disrupt the way in which we conceive the world. So much so that, the, that it's almost like a, a destructive force, you know. The blackness in its liberation has the potential to destroy the world. Um, and I think that, that, is, that that's, that's also a creative act because uh, in order I don't know, for, or in order for these glaciers to stop melting, something has to be so radically changed that it would almost be the destruction of the world. And, and not, not in the destruction of the world in a way like the climate change is doing, but other, another kind of creative destruction. Yeah, that uh, reminds me of a, a quote from Fred Moten, who's a brilliant um, black philosopher and writer. And just one line he says is, you know, blackness is the refusal to be reduced. And, and that sense where the um, like anti-blackness has been the foundation, it feels like, of so much in our capitalist world. <laughs> this, you know, and that's it's touching into the Afro-pessimism piece. And so as we embrace the, the image of black power, the image of black liberation, it does have the capacity to destroy what would be seen as the structure 
of a capitalist and, and ultimately white supremacist and anti-black culture. Mm -hmm. And so that you know, brings me to my last question before I want to open it up to our Q&A to the audience. This is about time, mm -hmm. right at Q&A time? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess this will be, if we can popcorn, you know, at the end we get an all happy answer. Um, so as we create, and each of you in your own ways are creating the, the liberatory, uh, uh, expansive view of what the black cowboy is from the intimate reality of lived life of the black cowboy, you know, to the conceptual picture of what that image is and its, and its power. Um, yeah, what are, what are some of the ways that you, um, yeah, what are the, some of the future visions if we start talking about time? What are some of the ways that you want to um, bring out and continue to grow this image of the black cowboy? What is it in your work that's going to um, create a new future where the black cowboy isn't you know, considered an anomaly or isn't a race, but is actually an active part of our future making? What are the ways that you see that happening in your work and in the world? That's a clear question. I know it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, maybe I just think about this too simplistically, too, in, in, in too simple and bold of a way. But I think that it, I, I go back to what what is being done in the, the, the collective. To me, is is the future. You know, more and more people, more and more young artists are coming along and they're producing work and they're, they're, they're thinking about these things in whole new ways. Um, and I think that is the future. You know, for me, just personally, my work, since I, most of my work happened 30 years ago, I'm, I want to go and, and I went to Houston uh, last summer and continued the photograph and ended up making more videos than I did uh, images, still images. but. Um, but I think for my work, I want to go back and, and meet with some of the people that I photographed. Some of the, you know, some of the images, like the man, that little boy is 35 now. <laughs> so I want to go back and, and photograph. I want to make that picture now. You know? <laughs> and I've already done it with a few people, but, but you know that whole idea of just how time works and you know, the, the progression of time? So for my work, that's what I'd like to do, and also create some videos, not huge documentaries, but just little snippets, almost you know, Instagram-sized vi uh, videos of people just talking about their experiences, maybe when they were photographed and what, what, where their life has gone. A lot of the photo, people I photographed were not around anymore. So, you know, just think about that, that sort of time travel in my, in my pictures. Yeah, no, I, what I appreciate about you, Ron, is that you did this first, but you're not like, oh, why are you copying, why are all these people copying me? You're like, no, this is good, this is collective, this is uh, this is a team team sport. <coughs> um, if, if I came up on this first, I would be bitter and... and, and <laughs> 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 but, um, as, as far as the future impact on it, you know, I I maybe think about it too simply as well. But uh, we were talking about capitalism. Um, there are economics to cowboy, especially to rodeo cowboy. It's expensive, um, and black rodeos in Oklahoma and in Houston um, have much smaller prize pools than white rodeos. You know, you look at a rodeo like Bowley, they have like, a, it's a $5,000 purse. Uh, you look at a, a similar size rodeo in Oregon, the St. Paul rodeo, and, and it's a $300,000 rodeo. And for a, a black rodeo athlete to compete at that level, they have to get a pro card, which costs, you know, six or $700. Uh, they have to have a horse trailer. They have to have a truck, uh, hotels. Like it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to compete in rodeo at a professional level. And there's still a lot of racism and inequity um, as far as sponsorship is concerned, um, as far as these rodeo leagues. So, um, you know, my my impact on the future of this is to 
do everything that I can to, to help athletes get sponsorship um, so that they can compete at higher levels. And uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I'm, I'm producing my own radio uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, which is the last place a black radio should be. <laughs> but it's close nearby, and, and I didn't really want to travel to do it. But, um, uh, you know, it's going to be a $60,000 radio, and, 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 and we're going to be able to distribute that money to black folks. And I'm hoping that it just like is a small um, push to start to change things. And to start to expose expose brands to these folks, and um, and and you know, hopefully in the next ten years, we'll see we'll see a much different landscape uh, in professional rodeo if it still exists. Like you said, it's you know, it's maybe dying. Like climate change is 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 an impact. You know, agriculture isn't what it used to be. Um, there are animal cruelty aspects to this. Like it, it, there's a lot of forces on this lifestyle and on this sport. So I don't know what it'll look like, but if it exists like it does now, uh, I want it to be a lot, a lot blacker. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to articulate this the best that I can. I was just, I love the question so much. Um, but I feel like um, through art, what you said about the collective, it made I shout her out in everything that I do, but Faith Ringgold is such an inspiration to me. Um, and I know so many other artists that are inspired by her. Um, she is just everything I would want to be. She's a wonderful artist, mother, teacher, um, organizer. And I feel like through her work, I've been able to create things that envision new futures. Um, I'm reading Green Engines by Lowe and DJ Kelly right now. Um, and it just has me thinking about ways in which I can create things to not only be hung up, but to also be a, a call to action, um, to have people you know, be out there trying to change the world in various ways that they think that they can and work collectively um, artists that are willing to collaborate with each other and people that are willing to work with their communities um, to create a better life for ourselves. And I always feel like I see this in specifically like black communities um, and I just want this to be able, I don't know, to spread um, and realize that you know, we're all in this together. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really beautiful thing that I hope to Continue to spread the message out. <laughs> <laughs> I was just listening to you all's answers and I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's open it up then to the rest of the audience. So um, I really would love to hear some of your thoughts and questions. Um, do we have a mic for them or do we want to hand over that? I read, well, first of all, it's a fabulous panel. It really is. It's just great on um, every level. Um, when is the your rodeo in Portland? It's uh, June seventeenth. Um, it's a it's a Juneteenth rodeo. Okay. This year. This year. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Fifty-seven days, so I, I must stress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just really appreciate this so much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and I sense the civil rights movement that I was involved in in the sixties. You know, it. I always had hope. You know, then hope. And do you think my question? I guess I should go with that. Uh, but my question is. You talked about you know anti-blackness, and um, and I feel like we were always just black people are ignored. It's like we have been invisible uh, in all the work that we've done and everything that we try to accomplish. And I'm wondering if you feel like um, we are making this progress just through what you're doing. Uh, because so much of what we do is 
is looked at as it's for black people, which, you know, talking about the black rodeo, so I remember a event that went to the uh, Pickens rodeo uh, when it was there. But um, I just made, perhaps that's the problem, is that anything that black people produce and that we do, including African American Museum, you know, at the Smithsonian, is looked at by our, because our society is really based on white, um, on a white perception of what America should be, and we don't really represent that. So I wonder if you think, or if you feel that what we do and other aspects of what we do, writings, black people have done, which now books are being banned, um, that this helps to promote, you know, what black people do enough that white society will stop looking at everything we do as being for black people instead of being for society, for American society. I don't know how you feel about it. Y'all want to jump in on that one? Go ahead. <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer, yeah, right, though, because you, you know, if you're trying to do that, what's that going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, that, you know, so I'm, I'm really into quantum physics. <laughs> So there's this search out there for one equation that's going to connect general relativity to quantum physics. And so they say we're about five Einsteins away from that. <laughs> so we're about five Frederick Douglasses away from trying to solve that problem. <laughs> it's going to be a long, long, long slog to me, in my opinion. And I think that what we're doing here, you know, Keisha's work, she's doing some amazing work. We're all doing this work, and we're just a, we're just a drop in the bucket. There's some amazing artists out there doing, and, and, and writers, and thinkers, and philosophers thinking about these things, you know. But I just think it's it's just gonna it's just gonna take a concerted effort. It's just a drumbeat, a constant, constant, constant drumbeat for, for that to happen. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. I don't think it's gonna happen, you know, the next year. I think it's just gonna it's just it's gonna be that. You gotta keep the pressure in the hose. You gotta keep pushing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try and say it was my point. Um, I have always felt like, specifically, the role of art is to start conversations, and so I feel like um, the answer to your your question would just be more conversations. Um, I recently saw a film through this completely DIY collective um, and he, the guy that runs it really talked about when you go see a movie in a movie theater, you buy your, you buy your ticket, you buy your concessions, you sit down, you're quiet, phone silent, you watch the movie, you get out, the next group comes in. So there's not really enough room for conversation to happen. And sometimes I feel like in the museum space, Obviously, that's the same situation. Um, you're, I mean, of, of course, people like whisper to each other, um, but I think that panels like this are also really wonderful because we're encouraging conversation to happen. Um, and yeah, so I just have always felt that even if things felt like it's exclusively for black people, um, I feel like it's everyone's responsibility to have conversations with each other about these things. Um, yeah, because I have critiques and stuff of the museum world um, and the art world, but I'm just grateful that I'm able to take what I consume and be able to bring that back to my community. Um, I, I'll answer just a little touch, or not answer, but just add a, a piece to the conversation. Um, that it's interesting to me, I, I was just in Ghana, I was recently there just the last four months doing a, a big work, and um, I was asked to, which it didn't work out in the end, but I was asked to present a, a presentation at the U.S. Embassy in Ghana, 
Um, and the topic they wanted me to talk on was um, the African diaspora influence on uh, global culture. And, um, and that's such an interesting question. It's like basically like how have black folks affected the culture of the world? Like how African diaspora folks affected the culture of the world? And my answer was, Everything. Yeah. I'm like, what am I supposed to say? Like music, fashion, like everything. It's philosophy, science, I mean, every single realm of our human experience has been incredibly, deeply, and profoundly impacted by African Amer African diaspora people, and African diaspora ideas, and artwork, and visions, and and I, and beings, and so. Um, that, that talk is broad, and so for me, sometimes it feels like it's actually more of a perception shift that is necessary for folks to be able to see the influence and the, um, the, the width of, of African diaspora's influence on everything. Like, to actually, to not just imagine that black art is only for black people. Black art has been for all people, for all society, and has moved society forward from the beginning. Right, all, all of the cultural stuff that we know is influenced by it. So if people stop seeing black art as somehow separate from society in its own thing and realize that it's part of the fabric of all society already, you know, all of the blues, even the idea of the cowboy comes as we're talking about from black people, you know, but there's this perception that cowboys are white, right? This is just the idea and that's what needs to be shifted and that's what might take a long time because that's ingrained in our minds, but it can also be really quick. And then you just stop and look <laughs> at the reality that we're living in. So, um, that's my take. Uh, yes, Jeff, yes, Jeff. Hello, uh, I'm Bob Romero. I'm a historian uh, of history of Taos, history of New Mexico, history of the Southwest. And so I'm somewhat familiar with the story of the Black Cowboy. And uh, you mentioned uh, Mexican Vaquero. Yes. And uh, so, um, I saw the article in the New York Times World this week, so I was very intrigued with uh, your presentation here. And uh, so, uh, in the case of the, of the Mexican vaquero, uh, it uh, uh, also is very visible in the bigger picture of the American cowboy, despite the fact that uh, uh, the Mexican vaquero had a lot of influence on the skills, the language, and uh, and the lifestyle of the cowboy, uh, just uh, and probably the, the black cowboys as well had had this had this influence. But just as an example on the Mexican uh, cowboy, the term rodeo itself comes from rodear, which means roundup. Uh, the term uh, lariat comes from larieta, the names of the horses, uh, spinto, palomino, mustenio, or, or Spanish. Even the term or uh, expression to dally, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, in Spanish, uh, means dale vuelta, give it the turn. And so uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, in your studies and research, have you found any interactions, uh, linkages between the Mexican cowboy and the, I mean the, the Mexican cowboy, the vaquero, and the black cowboy? I haven't found any linkages between the two, but uh, I've been to a lot of Mexican rodeos because there there aren't a lot of black or no, no black cowboys in Portland, um, but there are a lot of um, uh, parteros. Um, uh, there are escarmuzas. There are um, a lot of events on the periphery of Portland, and, and they're in incredibly exciting. To go to, um, but when I go, you know, there's a, a band, uh, with twenty people playing music, and then there's bull riders. They ride with both hands. Uh, it's a it's an entirely different sport. Um, there are you know women that ride side saddle and long beautiful ornate gowns, and uh, thousands of spectators like watching these events. And I'll, I'll typically be the only black person there. And um, people will question, you know, what I'm doing there or, or why I'm there. And I'm just like, I, I love how you guys get down. Like, I'm always <laughs> gonna, um, I go to the LP 
burrito uh, uh, rodeo outside of town, and and just have a blast. And, and there's some of my some of my actual best photos. Like uh, I've been to Guadalajara uh, in, in in shot events down there, and um, I don't do anything with the photos because it's not my culture, and it's not I feel my story to tell. But um, really, really appreciate the way that, that, that Mexican culture rodeos. I mean, that's a great question. I don't have any hard evidence in terms of you know, how Mexican cowboys and black cowboys, the ratio, <laughs> and how they, they work together. I do know that black cowboys, the, 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 the cowboys working back when, when you know, they were um, field work, a quarter of the black cowboys, or a quarter of the all cowboys were black. Now, I would imagine just anecdotally, black cowboys and brown cowboys probably did the lion's share of the nasty work mm -hmm. because nobody else would do that work. You know, so my, and I'm sure there's a, there's a, a, a statistic out there that, that you can probably find um, that I haven't found, but uh, I'm sure that they were working pretty much hand in hand to, to do some of that because all the cattle was coming up from, from Texas. Know, along the railroad lines and things like that. So um, I would imagine that there were quite a few black or, or Mexican cowboys working with the, alongside with the black cowboys to, to you know, create those ranches and things. So, you know, it's like a lot of the, 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 uh, the missions were basically the ranches, and they were run by, you know, the, the Mexican cowboys is what worked all that, built that land. So. I'm sure that there was a lot of cooperation between the two. Um, I will say, in my research, I have found there was quite a bit of overlap. Um, and um, specifically, there's a lot of firsthand stories. Even here in our, in our exhibit, there's some images in the historical section that are showing some of those relationships. There's photos of Mexican and um, black cowboys together, working together, um, especially in the very first part of the movements from the exodusters through the Great Migration. There was quite a bit of interrelationship as black folks moved out and were looking for and creating homesteads, as well as they said, like traveling, you know, ranching across the country. There are stories of them learning quite a lot, actually, from Mexican vaqueros. Um, from horse work to ranch work, there's there's a lot of stories in the sort of historical record around it. Specifically, some that I've read um, were coming from the um, born in slavery slave narratives from the WPA, um, their collected at the Library of Congress. So over 2,300 firsthand narratives of um, enslaved peoples and their experiences post slavery. And so in those, there's many times that they're talking about working with the vaqueros, traveling the land, um, and creating relationships. And so, especially in Oklahoma, there was actually quite a lot of mix. And down here in South Texas, of course, the borders were also quite uh, uh, fluid during that time. Um, and a lot of African-American people were living in northern Mexico. Um, there's a huge, uh, long history of relationship with northern Mexican people and African-Americans. Um, what is our time? One more question. Yes. Thank you. And, and actually, it's it's a question, and it's more just a compliment and an appreciation for all of you. And it's really kind of comes from the question that was asked first about the role that your work plays or might be playing in terms of helping to share the narrative of again. And I, I appreciate the idea that. Even uh, talking about the black cowboy or the black cowgirl is objectifying because it actually says this is the other of what is the norm. And I, I really want to say that I appreciate your work, not just because, again, I, mean, I appreciate the, the, the conversation in terms of the talk about the liberatory role of the work and of the, the commentary on anti blackness and creative destruction. Because I think it's important not just to understand that your work does not just help us to rethink the role of black 
person, black communities in the history of the, of the American West, but it also really should counter, it should help us to think about all of the narratives that we hold. And I think partly, again, particularly in this community is that I really appreciate that the Harwood has done this. I appreciate the, the curation. I appreciate all of you contributing to this because what it should do is not just say, are we rethinking what is a cowboy in terms of color, in terms of race, but also are we rethinking what your model is, what the role of the, again, the question of the black cowboy means for us in our community, in terms of saying, well, how are we thinking about these types of, how are we thinking about stereotypes? How are we thinking about communities? How are we thinking about roles in our own community? So I just really wanna say thank you for bringing that perspective. I don't wanna take away from the focus on, again, the importance of countering the narrative of cowboys being normatively white and not black, but I want to say that that is an inspiration and it should be an inspiration for all of us to think through in a community like the United, like Taos in terms of how we think about rules and how we think about who individuals are based on their racial history. So thank you. But so yeah, I mean, you just made me think that you know, like the way this country has always functioned, you know, you, you know, it's like it's always been what can, what what can black what, what are black people allowed to do? So you know, if you go back to the military, one of the most racist, you know, segregated institutions in this country, and probably the largest. So okay, we're gonna put black people in an airplane, see if they can fly an airplane. So we have to, to ski here. We put them in a tank division. So we have the Panther division, and on and on and on, you know, to say, what can black people do? But they perform stellar. Same thing with the Cowboys. They perform stellar. And, you know, so now if you look at the, at, at the uh, military, I mean, yeah, it's got its issues, but it's black people are doing some amazing things in there. You know, we have a black man running the whole military for Christ's sake. So, you know, I think if you think about the work that artists are doing in just this arena, in trying to promote the cycle of black cowboys and, and think about and contextualize the idea of black cowboys, I think that there, there's a lot of promise there, you know, but I think, again, you know, the hard work has to be done, but I think it will be done. I think it, eventually it will be integrated, but we're not necessarily thinking about black cowboys in that way. It's, it, it's equality in, 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 in the road, you know? I mean, there's a huge inequality there in terms of pay. You know, and uh, you know this country likes to be people like to be paid money to perform. You know, so all those kind of things are gonna, I think, eventually, it will it will level the field to some extent. Not to say that there won't be some bumps along the way, but I think the work is being done. We're doing the hard work. So. All right, well, thank you all so much, so much for this incredible well, This was beautiful. Thank you all for coming out today. Please do take your time to go and, and look at the work if you haven't, share it with your friends. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah. Um, and the conversation can continue. We will have a reception in the backyard. Um, I've heard the wind is not too bad out there, so um, we invite you to, to continue these conversations there. Thank you. Oh, and just before you all head out, um, I don't know, like as far as following up with each of your works, do you, do you have websites, Instagrams, anything like that you want to mention? Any new big projects that they should keep their eyes out before before they leave? Buy my book! Yeah, buy my book! Um, my website is my first and last name, Grace Fuller .com. You can find my social media there. Um, yeah. yeah, same thing, my name. Uh, that's how you find all my stuff. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm out there somewhere. I, mean, I don't have a website, I'm not on Instagram, I'm invisible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so my book's coming out next year, and it's going to be with a traveling exhibition that I'm going to put together. Uh, it'll be available for, for uh, exhibition uh, at probably 2024, at the end of 2024. The book is scheduled to come out in the spring of 2024, and if you just Google my name, things will pop up. So.